All right. We are in uh, John chapter 13 uh, in the New Testament. And I've given you notes that uh, have all of the scripture verses there so you can read along as well and uh, track with me. I, there's something that uh, I've become more aware in conversation is that uh, the Bible to a whole lot of people today seems like an ancient writing and not relevant to me today. And part of it has to do with the culture that we're living in today, that there's not a respect for history. You know, history's past, I'm, and I'm now, and I'm about me. And uh, that tends to be how we think, that uh, if, it's, if it doesn't satisfy something I want right now, it's not relevant to me, and I dismiss it. And somewhere in all of this is missing that there are true things about life that were recorded thousands of years ago in the Bible that are still true today. <clears throat> and there's a lot of pain, a lot of disappointment, a lot of hurt in this life because we don't pay attention to just some guidelines that God has given us in how to live. And those guidelines are in His Word. And we find them expressed in the life of Jesus, uh, in the things that He taught, the things He said, and the way He lived His life. And uh, I'm I, I would hope that uh, when we get done in any given Sunday that you have a, a little greater understanding of, of who Jesus is and what he said and what he said and how it might be relevant to me. How it would help me to have a better life, to have a good life, and have a life that I'm confident honors God. And uh, So anyway, that's kind of where I'm coming from. And I've already told you that uh, in the months that I'm with you here now that uh, we're going to be looking at... Uh, the Gospel of John, chapters 13 through 17, and that's the record of the last words that Jesus had to say before he died. <clears throat> um, I've seen that in my head, the, the picture of the image that uh, I had often wished I'd had this experience with my father, but I didn't, is that uh, we knew he was 96, and we knew that he probably wouldn't be around very long. And I had a lot of questions I wanted to ask him, but I was never ever able to ask. <coughs> I just would have liked his counsel about what did you learn in life that, that, that I should carry. And uh, what I have in my life is what I observed. I saw how he lived his life, I saw how he related to people, um, and I carry those things with me today. But I wish that I had a night like these men had with Jesus. Uh, that he wanted them to know these things. He says, hey, tomorrow I'm leaving you. Tomorrow they're going to crucify me, they're going to kill me, and I'm physically going to be done in this world, and I won't be with you physically. And these are the things I want you to know, the principles of life and relationships that I want you to know so you can live well when I'm not here. And... Uh, <clears throat> So we're looking at this. There were three lessons, two lessons that we've looked at so far. Uh, John 13, 1 through 17. The first lesson was to walk humbly together. Don't get up on your high horse and be proud and say, I'm better than you. Uh, walk in a humble manner with each other. And uh, <coughs> care about the other people around you. Walk humbly together. And then we looked the second week, we looked at John 13, 18 through 30. And there Jesus um, demonstrated that he knows all of us very well. He predicted that Judas was going to betray him. He knew that was going to happen. And he told everybody, and they didn't get it. They didn't understand. Uh, Judas knew because he had already made arrangements to, to give him up to the, to the Jewish authorities in a private place where the crowd couldn't get in the way. And so he knew. And he knew what was in the heart of Judas. And uh, we'll find today he even knows what was in the heart of Peter, the one who was always boisterous, the one who was always making proud, stupid, bragging about how loyal he is to Jesus. And we'll, well, we'll learn about that today. But that he knows about us, he knows each one of us. And this is a thought from other parts of Scripture that we get, the, we get the, the concept, understanding here, that Jesus knows what you're thinking right now. He knows what you're playing with in your head. Uh, 
he, he knows he, he knows what you what you like what you don't like he knows when you disregard him he knows when you've dismissed him um, he knows when you're being faithful to him when you're responsive to him he knows these things and what's amazing to me is the scripture teaches us that knowing these things he still loves you that he still loves me and that he's in pursuit of me helping me to understand life and understand myself and understand what he promises and what he brings to each one of us that uh, he doesn't dismiss us even when we dismiss him we learned that today in the lesson but God knows Jesus knows what's going on in our life he knows what we're thinking what we do what we don't do there isn't anything hidden from him. And that's part of my confidence when I come and I pray, when I talk with him, that I don't have to explain anything to him. He knows. He knows <coughs> better than I understand. But I can come. And, uh, well, today we're going to be looking at John 13, 31 through 38. And we will observe that Jesus teaches us the importance of love in our relationships with each other. That we treat each other in a loving way, a caring way, in an understanding way. So, I wanna read that text with you today. The uh, uh, page over here. This is, uh, today we're looking at John 13, 31 through 38, and it says, so when he was gone, and that was in reference to Judas, Judas had already left the group that night, he was going to go out to betray Jesus, so when Judas was gone, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him, if God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once, now those words sounded like gibberish to me, as I read, I said, you have to really concentrate and look at what he's saying, and um, <clears throat> well, I'll get you that. I'm going to keep reading with you. He says, now, my children, and that's how he's referring to his disciples, the men, these are men, and they traveled with him for three and a half years in all of his ministry, and he says, my children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. They had no idea what he was saying. But he was telling them, I'm leaving, I'm going to be gone. He could have used the word tomorrow. He said, tomorrow, I'm out of here. And in that context, he says this in verse 34, a new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And Simon Peter, totally out of context with what Jesus was just telling him, he went back to the statement, I'm leaving. And so Peter's asking the question, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. And Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. So this is our text for today that we're, we're looking at. And one of the lessons out of this that Jesus wanted to teach his disciples that night. And... Uh, I'm finding in this text three key thoughts. One, he says, I'm going away. Two, love one another while I'm gone. Look after each other. I've been keeping track of you. I'm trying to keep you in line. I'm trying to teach you all this time, but I'm going to be gone. So you look after each other. Care for each other's well-being. Help each other grow. Help each other reconcile with the things you do wrong that are hurtful. Be loving toward one another. And the third thing he said, Peter, for all of your confidence in yourself, I want you to know that tonight you're going to deny me. 
You're going to deny you even knew me. So those are the three key thoughts in the passage I just read. So the first key thought is, I'm going away. And, um, and Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, in verse 31, and, uh, and God is glorified in him. Uh, I've always had problems with the word glory. You know, I glorify God, or don't take glory in, and I'm going, what's glory? And um, this was helpful to me, uh, maybe helpful to you. Um, the, the Greek word that we translate glory um, comes from a root word, doxa, and that's the Greek word, doxa, and it means to have a good opinion or praise, to have a good reputation, to, be, to give recognition to. And so that's the, kind of the root of the word glory. And so when I say, when Jesus makes a statement here, now the Son of Man, uh, now is the Son of Man glorified, now is the Son of Man respected, He's being recognized. There's a good opinion about him. Uh, there's praise coming to him. Now, we use the word glory. That's a lot shorter than the rest of my definition here. But that definition, I think, helps us understand when we say glory. And that God is glorified in him. God is, God is honored. God gains reputation, recognition in what he did in his life. What Jesus did in his life. The Son of Man is now glorified. Meaning this, now. Why the word now? I, I'm, a, I'm, about to be, I'm about to be betrayed. I'm about to be arrested. I'm about to be beaten. I'm about to be hung on a cross. And I'm going to die. <coughs> how is that? How does that bring glory to God? Well, we'll look at that. If God is glorified in the Son, then I'll be glorified in Him. That's what Jesus said. As long as God gets glory, I'll be get glory. And if I get glory, God will get glory. And what that tells me, uh, as a disciple, uh, 2,000 years later, <laughs> but as a disciple, that when I do things that bring honor to God, He honors me. And when I honor God, it brings honor to Him. When, when, I give, when I give credit to Him for something that happens. When I'm honored and I give credit to God, God gets the glory. God gets the, the reputation for it. And, it, and it, it comes both ways. When God gets the credit, we get credited. There's glory that gets good that comes to us. Uh, so there's a, there's a reciprocal rep relationship between us and God. Uh, and I find in the practice of my life, when I acknowledge God, I give thanks to God, um, uh, I choose to do the things that he tells me to do, that good things come back to me. And when I choose to ignore God, and when I choose to do what I want to do, I usually pay the consequence of that. And God doesn't get any credit out of that. And God doesn't get honored in that. And I said... I'm better off in my life acknowledging God and His presence and His goodness and doing the things He's asked me to do because it's better for me when I do. The things I'm really seeking in life, God gives to me. I like respect from people around me. Well, I spent most of my childhood and into my young adult work trying to please everybody around me. Because I wanted to be respected. I wanted some glory. See? I never talked like that. But there was, I was always the one. I was never chosen to play on the team. If, there was, if everybody was lined up and you're gonna, you got two captains and they're going to pick who's going to be on their team, I was the leftover. And I, and I always, always felt like, like I'm nothing. And I had a, that kind of deep feeling in my gut most of my, most of my growing up years. Uh, and it wasn't until I, come in, I came into faith, uh, understanding what God did for me, what Jesus did in dying in my place, and understand the, 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 the value that he placed on us, <coughs> offering his life for us, 
that I started to gain some respect for myself, to understand God likes me. God thinks I'm okay. God's willing to go to the extent that he did to send his son to offer his life that I could have a relationship with God. That's a pretty high value to put on somebody. And that's the value I gained in relationship with God. <coughs> so, I'm going to move on here. I'll be here all day with you. I have a lot of things I want to share out of this passage, but we'll see how much we get. <clears throat> and then uh, he makes a statement, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. This is, this is from chapter, uh, chapter 17, just a, probably an hour down in the conversation that he had with the disciples. Um, he said, uh, I brought you glory on earth, God, by completing the work you gave me. That's what Jesus had to say to his Father. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. He said, Father, uh, I left you to come here. I left you to be a part of, uh, I, I, left, I left you to come and do what you told me to do, to offer my life as a sacrifice to pay the penalty that all of our creation deserves because of their rejection, because of their neglect of you. Um, <clears throat> there's some warnings that I'm writing here. Um, I, we come up to 57 across the 60 and 605 and we get off up here by the streetway. And, uh, and there are some mornings that we leave a little late, <coughs> and, um, and I, it really doesn't matter. I'm driving with everybody else going crazy on the freeway, so it's not like I'm at high risk. But nonetheless, I'm not obeying the speed limit sign. Now, this confession this may give me a ticket, I'm not sure, but, but I'm driving with everybody else, so I'm excusing my behavior by well, everybody else is. And I go, that doesn't make me innocent in the face of the law. And an officer pulls me over and he said, um, Ed, do you realize that you were going 80 in a 65 mile an hour zone? And I said, well, yeah, everybody was. He said, if I didn't, if I didn't move, they'd be in my trunk. He said, what, what's the posted limit here? And I said, well, 65 and how about it? Yes, I was going over the speed limit. I said, well, and he's writing out the citation and he hands it to me. Now, I have a choice. I can pay the fine or I can request a, a time in front of the judge. <coughs> and if I requested a time in front of the judge, the judge would eventually come to the conclusion that I violated the law and there's a penalty for violating the law. Now, and you could have paid the fine of $400. But because you didn't, and you've wasted my time as a judge, I'm fining you now $1,000. Because the law allows me to do that. Now you pay that fine, or you go to jail. And it's like, here I am living my life before God, without respect for Him, living my life in a way that's destructive to me and the people around me, self-focused, rebellious, angry, uh, all the negative stuff that, that we're really good at. And God said, I can't tolerate that. My law is really simple. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And the penalty for not doing that is jail. It's a life in bondage. It's a life separated from him, both now and for eternity. <coughs> it's death. And God, in his mercy and kindness, paid that penalty for you and me by Jesus offering his life, dying in our place, taking the punishment we deserve for our rejection of God's law, the rejection of God's person. 
And God says, out of his grace and his mercy, believe what I've done for you through my son. Believe what Jesus did when he died on the cross. And I forgive because my law has been satisfied. It's like I got fined um, standing in front of the judge, how do you plead guilty? And the judge says, $1,000. And the judge, I don't have $1,000, says, then it's jail time. The judge gets up, takes off his robe, he walks down to the bailiff there in front of the court, and he writes a check, and he pays $1,000. He pays my fine for me. That's what God did for us in Jesus. He satisfied his law, the fine is done. I'm guilty, uh, I have no other course, and he paid what I couldn't pay. Like the judge, Jesus paid for us what we couldn't pay. I'm trying to make it as simple as I can, but to bring down that there was something very real that happened 2,000 years ago that makes an extreme difference in our lives today. <coughs> and Jesus said, Father, I brought you, I honored you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. I'm coming and I'm offering my life tomorrow for all of your creation. And now, Father, I ask that you would bring glory to me by restoring me in heaven, in the Godhead. Jesus was focused on what would happen because of his death. And Paul described these events in Philippians chapter 2, and I've given you a picture of it here. Just And Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, it's in your notes. He says this, uh, your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. In other words, think of yourself in the same way he did, and live your life in the same way he did. So let this attitude be in you. Who, Jesus, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or hung on to, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Have the same kind of attitude. I spent uh, junior high, high school years um, in church. And, um, and I was taught to think pretty highly of myself. I don't think it was meant to do that, but I'm a Christian. I'm special to God. That's some of the mentality that I grew up with. And, um, <coughs> and there are times when, uh, when I'd be inclined to look down on people that made bad choices. And, and had bad consequences in their lives. And ah, you got what you deserve. You know, and I'd speak almost out of pride because I had a relationship <coughs> with God and they didn't. Do you understand how that can happen? And Paul's telling the Philippians, the believers in the church of Philippi, that he said, he said, listen, have the kind of attitude that was in Jesus, even though he was God. Part of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit. He emptied himself and took on the form of his own creation. He humbled himself and lived his life <coughs> among the people around him and offered his life as a sacrifice for them. He did things to <coughs> restore their relationship with God. And that thought turned my head. I have spent my entire life trying to help people understand what Jesus did on the cross for them. I've invested my life in that all over the world. And I take great joy in knowing the people who've come to faith and have walked in a new relationship with God because of, they've come to understand the significance of Jesus' death on their behalf. And he said, have that same attitude in you, in humility, that comes in one of sacrifice. And it says, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above, uh, that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and the glory of God the Father. So have this kind of attitude. And Jesus said, Father, restore me. 
for the place where I was. I've come, I've done what you've asked me to do. And in verse 33 in our text today, he says, My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me just as I told the Jews. So I tell you, where I am going, you cannot come. <clears throat> I'm going away. That was the first key thought. The second key thought we find here is uh, I'm leaving, so now you make sure to love one another while I'm gone. Don't compete with one another. Don't disregard one another. Value one another. Uh, there's some brothers here in the room. You know, that's some of the hardest thing to do is to, to respect your brother. You know? <clears throat> I don't know about you, your brother's probably a jerk, right? <laughs> and your brother probably thinks the same thing about you. Maybe not. Be grateful that he doesn't, if that's the case. You know? But I just know that, that uh, girls, boys, young men, young women, uh, tend to compete with one another in a family. And I said, he's, 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 he's basically saying, guys, don't you go about competing. If you remember last time I told you that after, well, the first time I spoke with you, after Jesus demonstrated what it meant to walk in humility with each other, the Gospel of Luke tells us that the guys, the disciples, argued among themselves who was the greatest. After Jesus just demonstrated, <clears throat> be a servant to one another. And then they argue about who's the greatest. <clears throat> Who gets more respect from mom and dad? Who got the best gift? You know, we do this competitive thing. And he said, just don't do that. Care about your brothers. Care about your sisters. Care about your family. Care about one another as a family of God. Love one another. And he said, to do that, just as I have loved you. Well, there's something unique, curious about this command. A new command, he says, I give you, love one another. And what's curious to me about this <clears throat> is that loving other people isn't a new command. <clears throat> when Jesus was there with his disciples in that place, that wasn't a new statement. 1,400 years before, we have the beginning of the writing of Moses, and we, we have there in what we call uh, <clears throat> Deuteronomy, the commandment that we're to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So for 1,400 years, that's been a command in written form that the people all knew. So this isn't a new command to love one another. In Leviticus, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. That again was 1,400 years before Jesus made the statement here. So what's new about this command? That you love one another as I have loved you. Well, what's new is love in the same manner in which I love you. That is new to the command. It's a new description, it's a new definition, new expectation that comes with this statement, love one another as I have loved you. <clears throat> and he makes a statement that <clears throat> when we do that, our relationship as believers in the church will be known by the community around us. And they'll know there's something unique about us, there's something unique about God because of how we relate to one another. Do we love one another? Do we respect one another? Do we care? Are we engaged in each other's lives? So what's new? <clears throat> in verse 1 of chapter 13, <clears throat> um, it's the introduction to that evening. <clears throat> Excuse me, it was just before that. <clears throat> I have too many plants growing right now. No, I don't need water. That, that doesn't help. I have lozenge. I'm working on it. 
we have a lot of plants and flowers that bloom around our house, and I have allergies, so it comes and goes. But um, <clears throat> we find that uh, this was a Passover feast that Jesus and his disciples were gathered together that night. And Jesus knew that his time had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, it says in the text, 13 verse 1, he now, Jesus, showed them the full extent of his love. That's a translation you have in your Bible that you're using. The literal translation of that phrase is he loved them to the end. You can see that he showed his full extent of his love he, to the end. He loved them to the full extent, to the end. But literally it means that he loved them to the end. And so the new command um, for us is to love others around us all of our life, not just in the moment, but throughout life to the end. He says, I want you to love one another as I have loved you. And I've loved you through thick and thin. I've loved you through the hard times and through the good times. I've loved you to the very end. And that's how he wants us to love each other. <coughs> it's like, um, I did something. Uh, Austin told me something in private. <clears throat> And I used it as an illustration speaking in front of everybody. Now, I'm making this up right now, I, okay? But, so I, I'm, in my story I'm making up, I have offended Austin, and I betrayed him because I told something publicly that he told me privately. And now he doesn't trust me. And I come to Austin, I said, Austin, I'm really sorry. I just wasn't thinking about it. I, I didn't mean any hurt. I didn't mean to hurt you, but I did, and I know that. And I'm really sorry about that. But he's not going to forgive me because it was too painful for him. See? See what I'm saying? So I didn't love him by betraying his confidence, and he doesn't love me because he won't forgive me. Do you understand what I, you see the story I'm telling? So that happens with us in families, it happens in our relationships and friendships that are here. And he says, I want you to love one another as I have loved you and do it to the end, through thick and thin, through the hard times. Be forgiving of one another because I'm forgiving of you. Be an encouragement to one another because I'm encouraging to you. Value one another because I place value on you. Love me as I have loved you. That's what he's telling Love one another as I have loved you. So one is do it through all your life. And then he said this, this is my command, love each other as I love you. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. This is in John 15. He said this about 30 minutes after he made the statement about loving one another as I love you. He said it again. He said, um, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I call you friends. For everything I've learned from my Father, I've known to you. And Jesus just said, uh, <clears throat> Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Love sacrificially. There's something you want to do, and you've been wanting to do it a long time, and you finally have an opportunity to do it, but your friend <coughs> has a need. It's, it's, it's pretty serious to them. It's not like it's important to them. And they need you. Are you going to choose your friend? Are you going to choose what you've been wanting to do for this whole long time and it finally came and then you could do it? Some event, go to something, go do something. But now I have to choose. Do I do what I want or do I serve my friend? And he's saying, Jesus has chosen to serve us. He came and offered his life as a sacrifice for us. Do that with one another. Choose to live a life that's loving and sacrificial. Care for the other people around you more than yourself. That doesn't mean devalue yourself. Uh, don't become a doormat. You know, everybody walks on you. But make the choices of your life to serve others as opposed to serving yourself. That you will see all kinds of opportunities 
<coughs> Every day you'll see opportunities to do that. <coughs> so love one another all through life. Love one another sacrificially. <coughs> and what does that look like? <coughs> and I'm looking at Romans chapter 5, verse 6. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, rebellious, rejecting God, unfaithful, unbelieving, while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. <clears throat> he took all the penalty upon himself. Jesus died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. It's 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 2 says, And he himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree, on the cross, <clears throat> so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. By his death, life has come to you. And then I have one other thought here <clears throat> I'm going to leave you with too is that but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. This is from Galatians chapter 5, and it's not a, out in the context of what kind of characteristics come out of our life. And there's a whole long list of uh, the way we live our life that's lived in what's called the flesh. We live in the body, we live by our own passions. And they're all negative experiences. They're all, they're all destructive behaviors that are like. In contrast to that, he said, but the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, why, that, why does he use the word fruit? Um, we, have, uh, we have three trees in our yard, in our backyard. Fruit trees. And um, there's a time in the year when you wouldn't necessarily know what tree is which because they're all branches and leaves. But then blossoms come and then a fruit starts to form. And we know, oh, that's the lemon tree. Oh, that's the peach tree. Oh, that's the plum tree. Because of the fruit, it becomes evidence. And so he says, the fruit of the Spirit, the evidence that the Spirit of God is present in our life is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When those characteristics are present in our life, they're evidence of the Spirit of God in us. I'm an impatient person. My wife reminds me of that often. It's only because it's true, sadly. Um, if it's the right thing, now's the right time. Um, if I have time to do it, now's the right time. I want it done now. I don't want it hanging on. I just, now, I want it now. And I love the song that somebody wrote. Uh, Lord, give me patience and give it to me now. <laughs> you know, it's like this whole attitude that... Uh, is not a healthy thing to me. And so I, I often would take the posture, I just want to, I have to work on my patience. But that's not what God's Word teaches us. It says, walk close with me, trust me, live in relationship with me, and patience will be evidence in your life. Duh. Begin to trust God, acknowledge God, live in relationship with him, and these characteristics are the fruit, the evidence of his presence in me. And love is the first one on the list. If I have a hard time thinking about somebody else, caring about somebody else, it's probably a good thought that you don't have a relationship with God that can produce that kind of fruit. So start seeking God. Spend some time reading in his Bible, in his word. And if you don't understand it, find somebody who can help you understand it. Because once you get going, you'll, you'll get the idea. And, and when you read, the Spirit of God will prompt you 
It's one of the principles of Scripture. The Holy Spirit of God prompted the writers of the New Testament and the Old Testament. What they wrote, the Holy Spirit prompted them to write. That's what Scripture tells us. And the same Spirit who prompted the men to write the things they wrote is the same Spirit who gives you understanding when you read it. That's, the Word also tells us that. But how would you know that if you weren't reading it? You see what I'm saying? You, you got to get your head into the book. But if you have a hard time getting started in it, find somebody who will help you. And I'm, I'm one of those. I, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll spend time on Zoom or I'll text with you or come see you. But uh, get your head into the God's Word, the fruit of the Spirit. So the new command that, that's new for us, one is, I want you to love somebody through life. And, and I want you to love them sacrificially. And I want you to love them with the ability that the Holy Spirit gives you. And that's a love that's beyond the limits of your human inability. When you can't, God can and he says in verse 35, by this all men will know you my disciples if you love one another. And uh, um, I, I have some uh, I have some texts that I, I refer to when I do my, my preparation for here, but one of them is the Life Application Bible Notes. Uh, they've been helpful sometimes, but there was something particularly out of this one, so I'm gonna read this to you. Uh, it raised some significant questions. And the question was this, what do people see in our church? When people come and visit here, or drive by, or just meet one of our families, what do they see in our life? Do they see a friendly place? Do they see an open door? Do they see a, a caring group of people, a happy group of people? Do they, what do they see? <coughs> or do they see here, petty bickering, jealousy, division? Or do people know that we're Jesus followers by the love we have for one another? And love is an attitude that reveals itself in action. And uh, they raise the question here, how can we love others as Jesus loves us? And this is a list of things they gave. They said, by helping when it's not convenient. By giving when it hurts. <clears throat> By devoting energy to others' welfare rather than our own. By absorbing hurts from others without complaining or fighting back. This kind of love is difficult. <coughs> that is why people notice when you do it, when you do love one another, uh, they know that you're empowered by something that's unusual and supernatural. Or you get loved like that, and they want that kind of love. That's the attraction of our relationship, the attraction to God is our relationship with each other. And the, just the closing thought here with you, the third key thought from this passage is uh, Peter says uh, he totally misses the statement about loving. He goes right back to the statement that Jesus is leaving, and he's concerned about himself. He said, I want to go where you're going, and if that means my life, I'll lay my life down. And Jesus exposes his heart and said, Peter, before the night's out, you're going to even deny you knew me because you're so afraid of dying. You're so wrapped up in yourself. And that night, they, the, the crowd came and they seized Jesus and took him away to the house of the high priest. It's there in Luke 22. And Peter followed at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard where the, the high priest was, uh, Peter sat down uh, with them. A servant girl, uh, a little girl, uh, saw him seated in the firelight, and she looked closely at him and said, This man is with him, with Jesus. But Peter denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also were one of them, one of the disciples. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he's a Galilean. He could tell by his accent. And Peter replied, man, I do not know what you're talking about. Three times. Just as Jesus said it would happen, happened outside the courtyard of the high priest. 
and Jesus was was held up above, walking by up above the courtyard that was there. Just as he was speaking, Peter was speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word that the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. I think it would be helpful for you to know, in spite of that kind of denial, God's love kept pursuing Peter. Several days, weeks passed by, and the disciples were, went back to their old trades, fishing after the death of Jesus. And Jesus went up and met him at the Sea of Galilee. And uh, they were fishing just offshore. And Jesus came up and he started a fire. He was going to fix some breakfast. This is the resurrected Jesus. Dead, buried, raised from the dead. And he's there. He's physical, he's spiritual. I know he's not physical. He just looks like he has a physical body, but he's spiritual. I don't know what that's going to be like. But he tells us someday we will too. But he just said when he finished, he said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these, more than fishing? Something you need to see in this. There are two words that are translated love in English, but in Greek they're two different words. One is agape, and that's a sacrificial love. And the other is phileo, and that means like a friendship, a brotherly love. A friendship love as compared to a sacrificial love. And so Jesus uh, uh, asked, uh, asked Peter, he said, do you truly love agape, me, more than these? Uh, yes, Lord, he said, you know that I, phileo, friendship, love you. Didn't respond in the same, because he couldn't. I betrayed you. You know, he's still carrying that. Jesus said, feed my lambs, I have work for you to do. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? Do you agape me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I let hope, friendship, love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. I have work for you to do. And then a third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love, let me? Do you even love me as a friend? And Peter was hurt, grieved, because Jesus asked him the third time, do you Love me as a friend, even. And Peter said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you as a friend. And Jesus said, I have work for you to do. Peter denied Jesus three times. And three times Jesus asked him, do you love me? Do you love me with a sacrificial love? And Peter couldn't say that. That I love you as a friend. Then love me as a friend. I have work for you to do. I take confidence in Jesus' love for each of us and our boastful failures. It was Peter of all the disciples who stood up in the temple before the people who crucified Jesus and declared Jesus to be promised Messiah. And he did so at the risk of his life. He's back in Jerusalem, he's at the temple, thousands of people there, and he says, the one you crucified is the Messiah. And the crowd repented, and 3,000 people came to faith in Jesus as the Messiah that day. And it was Peter who spoke, the one who denied even knew him. Something changed in Peter's heart and life. The Spirit of God was present in him. He was walking in a relationship with God in which he stood in God's strength and not his own and in his confidence and not his own. He was empowered by the Holy Spirit. <coughs> so I leave you with that today. That's our text. Uh, um, we'll move on in the conversation. He talks more in, uh, in chapter 14, he talks more about uh, uh, his leaving and what that, what that means to the disciples, where he's going and what's gonna happen. And uh, they have a conversation that uh, 
pretty deep and meaningful, I think, for us. So I'll be back with you in three weeks. Thank you. Missing a missing a week there. You've given me kindness. You gave me Father's Day off. <laughs> and that's a that's a big time at our house. And so I appreciate you doing that. Lord, we're grateful to you that you love us and you know all about us and still love us and care for us. Uh, help us to embrace the things you teach us in ways that to make a difference in our life. Open your word to us. Help us to understand when we read. Help us to learn about you and about ourselves. Lord, we're just grateful to you that you're so gracious, kind to us, forgiving, and loving. And we come in your name. Thank you. So we continue for this, and uh, thank you for okay. so today. Right. Whoever will come, follow to the communion. Communion. Okay. Okay. But before that, please, I have to make a documentation again. <laughs> Take a picture oh. together, <laughs> because sometimes they forgot how many.